I'd like to thank Early Bird Gummies for being a sponsor of the Suds with Luds podcast. Early Bird Gummies are a recreational hemp product and contain 2.5 milligrams of natural THC and 12.5 milligrams of CBD in each gummy. They are formulated with a microdose of THC and are designed to make you feel good. I can tell you this, from a guy that doesn't sleep very well about four hours a night, I tried my first gummy and it was probably the best sleep I've had in a long time. Also, if you go to the website, earlybirdcbd.com, and you get 20% off on your first order. Thanks, Early Bird. All right, well, welcome to another episode of Suds with Luds today, presented by the Dub Network. And normally when I come in here and I always introduce a guest, I, I have you know a special guest, this and that, and I was trying to come up with it last night. To me, what I have today is I have an important guest. And former Dallas star, NHLer, Stephen Johns. Stephen, welcome today. I appreciate you coming here. Uh, I'm assuming that the reason you're in town is because of this past weekend, the Big Hearts Celebrity Challenge that we played. Yeah, uh, Marty sent, sent me the invite probably four or five months ago, kind of just put, put it on my radar, and uh, I kind of learned more about the Grant Halliburton Foundation, and it was kind of a no-brainer for me to come down, and uh, obviously to support something like that and to be, you know, come back to my second home, it's... Uh, it was it was a it was a, it was an amazing weekend. It was a it was an event that we did and it raised a bunch of money. It raised a bunch of money. I mean, it was it was a good event. Marty Turco runs the Dallas Stars Foundation, did a hell of a job in this thing, and Bobby Baston with the alumni. Uh, we had an event, an auction kind of thing, the night before on a Thursday night. Um, you know, yourself was here. Darian Hatcher was here. Mike Commodore was here. Blake Como played. Oh yeah, Gwen Gretzky was here. I forgot about that guy. Came into yeah. town. <laughs> yeah, he didn't put the skates on on Friday though. He came in for the event, and he's always such a super guy and he just handles the people so well um when did you skate have you been on the ice no I was, was, that was that the first, first time uh, first time i skated since my last game we played four games on friday <laughs> they were they were 13 minute periods so you know it wasn't a normal game but we played four games and they were all accepted by that an hour and a half i think is what our time at least for my group that's what it was how did you feel out there yeah, it was a big wake-up call. Uh, I, I got to get back in the gym now. It was, <laughs> was the worst I've ever felt. Um, really Is that right? Oh yeah, I haven't. I mean, I haven't really done much since I retired. Still, still kind of can't because of the headaches. But yeah, um, yeah, it's time to time to get back in some type of shape. <laughs> well, and you mentioned headaches, and that's kind of why we're here, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that, and, and that's why I think that you're an important guest because. As as hockey players, especially, I can't. I don't always. I, in fact, I can't speak for other sports. But I think we've, at least in my time, we've always kind of said we're never hurt. You know, what I mean, we we we, we denied enjoyed, everything. Yeah, or we all. I I always enjoyed playing hurt. Yeah. Like if I separated my shoulder or I had a bum knee or something, I I loved. I felt like I played better because you have to dig in a little bit more. Yeah, right? yeah, and um, it's just kind of the pride that we have as hockey players. I remember I I didn't miss I didn't I didn't miss one. The only the first game I ever missed was when I, after I turned pro from an injury. Uh -huh. So my entire career, I mean, through you know, <laughs> through minor league hockey, through travel hockey, through college hockey, um, I was never injured. I mean, I had nicks and bruises, but never an injury that kept me out. So that was a. Uh, that was probably the hardest part, not being able to, to do what you're supposed to do all the well, time. Well, you mentioned before you turned pro. So let's well, first off, let's start wampum. I, there, there seems to be. I read a couple little things, and it called you a country boy in a small town. And I'm kind of like from a town of 1,200 people. How big is wampum? And tell us about it. Yeah, well, it's uh, native for. Uh, in, it's like native money. It's like their currency back in the okay. day. So, it's. Uh, it was. I think it was founded in the 1700s. Old school town. Uh, no red lights. Uh, with no gas stations. Still. Yeah, still. There's one church left, and uh, I actually just got rid of our bank. <laughs> so we, we're holding on to our post office, but uh, it's about 600 people. And then um, I, where I went to high school is the town over about eight miles away at about four, four to 5,000 people. So it's kind of where I, I did my hanging out and uh, where all my buddies live. So 
So no banks. What are you doing? Are you burying money in the ground in a mason jar? Or <laughs> I'm what? like Pablo Escobar. How close uh, is the next closest town to you? Uh, it's like eight miles where the where the big town is. That's that's what we call it, I guess. Okay. <laughs> so you obviously you were the big dog, uh, but you had a couple brothers, right? I uh, have older brother, younger sister. Yeah. Okay, one brother, and is he the one that played hockey? And you thought he was going to make it, or you... yeah, he was always. I mean, he was he was an unbelievable player. He would play in tournaments and score four or five goals a game. Kind of those crazy stats as a kid that. You see most of the stars in the NHL yeah. have. And then he was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the age of like 13. So he had to quit. It was just causing him too much pain in his hips. So that was also like a, <clears throat> a big thing for me. He quit when he was 15, I think, or 14. And that was right whenever I started realizing that I was pretty good at mm -hmm. hockey. So that kind of gave me even more of like a, a burden. It's like, okay, I have to do what my brother couldn't physically because of his, you know, unlucky genetics. But, um, you know, yeah, it was, uh, it was the only reason why I played was because of him. Right. Older brothers, you do what you do, so. So being in a small town, I know when I when I played where I played, I mean, we had just enough, well, I'm assuming the same with you, just enough kids to make a hockey team. There weren't tryouts and things like that. How, and I, for myself, it was small colleges and things like that. You'd get a letter from here and there. And the only time we ever really got, <coughs> sorry, the only time we'd ever really get recognized is, when we went and played at like the state championship, which is Madison, Wisconsin, yeah. now you're on a big stage all of a sudden, and we never did shit when we were there. But how how did you get discovered? Because you ended up going to Notre Dame. Yeah. Did you get recruited there? Did you get a full ride or any of the scholarship stuff like that? But how did they find you first off? So I kind of had to. Uh, I was the only. Me and uh, my friend were the only kids in town that played hockey, so we had to try to do some traveling and. Uh, I actually had to switch teams because we didn't have enough kids to have a team. We only had six kids in the area. So then we had to travel about a half hour a half hour further away. And then that was double A. I played that for about three years and then kind of made the step to triple A. And um, but I remember I got discovered for baseball before hockey. I okay. got yeah, I got <laughs> I remember getting my first college letter and it was from Notre Dame actually. And it was I thought it was gonna be a hockey letter and I opened it up and it was the, a baseball letter. So at, after my sophomore year of high school, I had to decide whether to play baseball or hockey because it was getting to that point where I was yeah. really good at both. And uh, I got invited to the 40 camp at national team, the national team program in Ann Arbor and made that team. And then from there, it was uh, my best friend there was Brian Rust. Yeah. And he was already committed to Notre Dame. And I took a visit there and um, kind of the, the, the. So were you a walk on? No, no, I was a uh, full scholarship. Oh, they gave you a full scholarship yeah, right yeah, away. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. That's um, always parents love that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. Well, that was my my whole goal. Is I actually almost went to Bowling Green because they were the first school to offer me a full scholarship. And <clears throat> from the beginning, it was I just want to go to school. I didn't. I didn't really. I obviously dreamed of playing in the NHL, but biggest thing was getting my college education. So paid you were for. into the education thing. You weren't yeah. just a, an athlete. Yeah. I remember. I remember when the OHL draft was happening. Erie called me and asked me if I wanted. They had the second overall pick, and they asked me if I wanted to play in the OHL or go to college and at that time they were the worst they were one of the worst teams in the league right. and I wanted to get my education paid for and obviously um, I picked a pretty pretty awesome school. Did you so. guys so you were there all four years at yep. Notre Dame right? Did you guys national championships? No we uh, we still have yet to win one at Notre Dame. Uh, we made it to the Frozen Four my freshman year and then we were top ranked for the next three years it was we made the tournament three out of the four years and just just couldn't get the big one done. I'm assuming because you were into education, you probably didn't have any problems balancing nightlife, <laughs> the outside uh, of the hockey, the <laughs> hockey in the school. Let's just say 8 a.m. statistics class on uh, <laughs> on Monday mornings was uh, that was it was a, that was an adventure. Tough um, one to get to. Yeah, I mean, because in college you play Friday and Saturday. Yeah. So Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, you're in college. Yeah. And Wednesday was our cutoff, so it was. Oh, I mean, it was the best. See, that's why people ask me about coaches today in the NHL and things like that. And I always go back to college coaches and, and for two reasons. One, the, the player, the kids today are a little bit different. They're wired differently. Uh, you need to know how to, and I think you're probably in the middle of that, but the uh, players yeah, today, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. They need to be talked to and not coddled, but you know what I mean? Yeah. They're different. And I think you you were probably just before that or coming into that. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit of a mix of it. I mean, I had a pretty pretty stern dad, a pretty strict dad. Yeah. Um, if, if I did something wrong, I, he let me know. And so I never really responded to other 
people screaming at me yeah. if it wasn't my dad. So I was kind of more in the middle of, okay, you can yell at me, but you know, put your arm around me a little bit sure. and, and show me the way because I didn't know anything about hockey. I didn't really know anything about, I just played. Right. Like I remember when I got invited to the 40 camp at, at, for the U.S. National Park, I had no idea what it was. And I just, all I want to know is I wanted to play college hockey because at the time it was always on, it was always on ESPN and yeah. just looked so sweet with the student sections. So it was a pretty easy decision. Were there any nerves, jitters, like your first game, college, or was it seamless? Uh, it was on, it was honestly seamless because I came in with a big role. Uh, we had Ian Cole and Teddy Ruth and they had just left, they left. Yeah. So they would, would have been seniors my freshman year, but they left. So it opened the door for you know, a bunch of ice time. So I played 25 minutes pretty much my whole college oh, wow. career, freshman to, to senior year. So it was such a, a huge development stage for me because at the program, I had a lot of guys in front of me. I was the sixth, seventh D-man and uh, kind of got lost in the way because they were, I mean, mm -hmm. all those guys got drafted in front of me. And, uh, but yeah, it was a, it's been a journey. So when did you get drafted? Which year? Your first year of college? Uh, yeah, 2010. First year out of college? Yeah, first year going into college. First so I got year. Oh, so you went in college yet. No, you got yeah. drafted before you even went there. Yeah. Okay. So then wow. I, yeah, so then after my junior year, I remember Chicago kind of, not pressuring, but asking me kind of if I wanted to turn pro. Or, yeah. And I remember have, having a conversation with my agent, and he was kind of saying, you know, you'll probably spend most of the year in the minors, maybe get a couple games at the end of the year. And I kind of we had a conversation. I had a conversation with the coach at Notre Dame, and I wanted to get my degree. So that that was really the driving factor. Yeah, you wanted. Yeah, to get I mean, I had done three years there. Um, at that point, I didn't really know about pro hockey. I didn't want to grind in the minors for yeah. ten years, and I was really wasn't having the greatest college career that I, or the college career that I expected. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, that was that was probably one of the easier decisions to make was staying just because. We had a great team. We had 12 guys in my class. Mm -hmm. Anders Lee ended up leaving, but uh, we had you know, 11 guys left in our class, and it was just you know, senior year of college. There was nothing. I had one class in the fall, one class, or two, three classes in the fall, one in the spring. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing like senior year of college. <laughs> exactly. Right? You get all your work done the first three years, yeah. and then you can sit back and just play hockey and have a little fun. Oh, a lot of fun. <laughs> so, how, so you're drafted by Chicago. How was the day that you find out of the trade? It was actually funny. Uh, I was at a pool party. It was like eight eight thirty, like July sixth or something like that. It was like eight thirty at night, and my phone was on the music, and it, someone kept calling me, and whoever wasn't closest to it just kept side buttoning it. Well, it was Stan Bowman. Okay. So I had about three, four missed calls from Stan Bowman, so I called him right back, and he he let me know that I was I was getting traded, and he let it, let me know it wasn't anything personal, blah blah blah, um, and uh, he ended up ended up in Dallas. Thank God. What were your thoughts when you were going? Wait a second! I was I was a member of the Chicago Blackhawks, and now we're going to Dallas. I mean, was it excitement or was it man? I wish I'd have played in Chicago. Yeah, it was a little bit. I mean, because you always there's always a, a part of your heart that stays with the team that drafts you. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember after my first year pro or in the playoffs in Rockford, my first year, I broke my arm, and if I wouldn't have broke my arm that night, I would have gotten called up because that was the night like Roosevelt went down. Uh, like three D went down in one game. Yeah, and uh, I remember they were like, "You have to go get X rays if your arm's not broken. You're playing tomorrow night in Anaheim in the Western Conference Finals, Game Three, and huh. and it ended up being broken. And I watched them win a cup with a with a cast on, and then got traded the <laughs> to, <laughs> a to couple Dallas. weeks later. And <laughs> so it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a whirlwind of a couple months there. But um, yeah, I remember getting traded to Dallas and pulling up the roster and. I didn't know anybody. Right. Yeah, the only person I knew was Jack Campbell. Yeah. So I played with him at the program, and uh, it was kind of like a fresh, clean slate. You know, I had some buddies in Rockford that I knew or played against in college, and I literally went down to Austin and didn't know a single soul. And, uh, so awesome. you mentioned Rockford, and then you mentioned Austin, where the Texas Stars are. And I saw something that you had said that the most fun that you had was playing in the minors. Oh, yeah. Why do you, why do you say, you know, everybody thinks, man, you, you need to be in the pros, and that's where you want to be. And, and the pros are, but it's there, it's more of a development thing, obviously. Yeah. Why why did you say it was most fun? Like, well, one, I was in Austin. Yeah. Uh, no, it's pretty, yeah. But then in the same, and then, uh, you know, you have, everyone's pretty similar in age, similar in, in, in wage, which mm -hmm. is a huge yep. Thing in a locker room you know there's not many egos in the in the minors because yeah. everyone's kind of in that same i need to get to the nhl kind of mode 
and we just had such a good time down there. We golfed so much. I mean, we wasn't about the hockey. Yeah, because we would play Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we wouldn't play again until next Friday. I mean, we have two home series back to back, so it yeah. was four days to. How about the travel? It wasn't bad. We played San Antonio a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so that drive was pretty easy, but um, I remember when I was in. Yeah, it was it was pretty brutal the last year I was there because that was when they brought all the California teams in. So we'd go out there yep. back and after after being in the NHL for a bit and flying on those planes, it. You get spoiled. Yeah, right? yeah, it's that's yeah. yeah. Well, and again, you're coming from a college environment in Notre Dame. Now you're going to Austin, who yeah. is, you know they got a couple of nice colleges there. We flew private in, at Notre Dame too. So oh, you I went did? from private back. Yeah, so you've been spoiled since you've been in school. Yeah, Notre Dame was insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now <clears throat> you do the whole American League thing, and first game, first NHL game. Yeah, it was against the Hawks. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly don't really remember it. Um, really? Yeah, I remember I remember sitting on the bench and watching, like, Taves go by, and then I well, go... Now, like, why don't you remember it? Not, it had nothing to do with the no, concussion? No, no, nothing. Like it that. was just kind of, like, one of those surreal, I can't believe I'm in this moment. Yeah. I remember watching the um, National Anthem and, like... What, almost, was it in the state, in Chicago? In, yeah, it was in Dallas. Was oh, in it was Dallas, in Dallas, yeah. okay. <laughs> So, uh, but it was funny because I got called up and they were on like a four or five game losing streak and we got absolutely bagged the first day that I was <laughs> yeah, up. You get up? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think we had 4D for the whole practice, four or five D for the Who practice. Who was coaching that year? Was it, was, it Jimmy? It was, it was Ruffles. Oh, it was? Yeah. Okay. And then um, I think I might be one of the only guys to be in both minor league and NHL team pictures. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we had a team picture in Austin and then I got called up the next day and then I was... When yeah, I, the yeah, day yeah, I called both. up, I didn't never play in the, in, in, in the NHL, yeah. and I wasn't picture. <laughs> Who was your first partner? Uh, dude, Johnny Oduya. Was it? Yeah. Well, now you got a veteran. Yeah, and it was Stanley Cup winners. Yeah, so I played the last thirteen games of the season, or twelve or thirteen games, and played the first second round with him. And I just remember him being like just rock solid for me. Any time I needed to ask him anything, he was he was there. He was there for me. We watched video on the planes together. Like he was a big. Wow, that's yeah. That's a pro. Yeah, like I would just be on the plane kind of decompressing from, you know, maybe nine, ten minutes. Of, right. But yeah. it felt like I played 40. Right. And uh, he would come up with the iPad, sit next to me and show me what, you know, what I did right, what, what, we need could, what we could do better as a pair. And that kind of helped me carry that into the following years with my new yeah, partners. Yeah, and then step and, up in more minutes and yeah. taking on a bigger role. I, <clears throat> I remember I, I talked to a couple guys in upstairs and, you know, they were always looking, make changes, you know, and who can you add to your team and things like that. And I, I would talk about you and there were times I'm like, dude, he, he can he can be a number two for that top defenseman. Like to me, you were you were the perfect fit. Like if you played with, like again, if it was a Klingberg, a Haskin and, you know, guys like that. And I, I'd look and, you know, we'd, I'd be doing games with Razor and I'm, at times I'm like, Jesus, he, he's leading the team in hits. He's leading the team in block shots. You can skate. You, you actually love to hit. Oh, I, was, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think that was, I think that's what drove you. It seemed like when you, it, the sooner in a game you could get a hit in, the better you felt or you played. Yeah, it was like, I, and it was, um, you know, I didn't like to fight. I mean, I don't. I don't did you like to Unfo fight? Did you no, like? I don't the, think like, any. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say. That. I played with a Sometimes, lot of guys that yeah. loved to fight, yeah. but that was their role, and they knew that that was how they were going to stick yeah. around. But when you and I was lucky to have you know Shane Churla and Billy Heward and Chris Nyland from Montreal and you know Shane Corson and so and I don't want to throw Corson into the fighter thing. I don't even know who Corson is. It's unfortunate when I mention guys are like who, and I'm like <laughs> these guys were you know studs at the time. So. But that was, you know, that was at a time when that they were part of your team. Yeah. <clears throat> and then as the salaries kind of went up, it got to be where, you know, some of those guys, not the guys that I mentioned so much, but you know, some of the other guys in the league were, well, we can't be paying them six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year if they're only playing four or five minutes a night. Right. You know what I mean? So, so to answer your question, no, I, I, I mean, it seemed like I fought more in a bar or yeah. off ice than I did <laughs> on the ice. You know, so, uh, <clears throat> but no, but I, I just felt that you were that that guy and like why are you guys looking someplace else because he's right there in front of you so now let's get into when the head trauma or those kind of things would you what what was the first one what was the first one that i, I guess would be initiated or lit, lit yeah. that unfortunate fire so i remember the actually the, like the worst 
honestly, the, to my opinion, I still think the worst concussion I had was my first one that I got in Rockford. Um, I got hit from behind and I just got buried. It took me like two months to even be able to watch TV again. Yeah. And now, did you have any concussions earlier as a kid that you know of? Not that I know of, okay. but now, now right. that I know what a concussion really is, I, like people have asked me how many I've had and it's like diagnosed, maybe 15 to 20. Wow. But that you didn't even know that were the cobwebs you just oh, shake hundred, it off, right? Hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Like the taste of iron in your mouth, um, like almost like the taste of blood. I, I would I would always after like a huge open ice impact I'd always get like your teeth hurt and you'd kind of like taste blood and I mentioned that to a neurologist the one time and one of the thirty neurologists I worked with and how many <laughs> like fifteen or thirty yeah it was oh. yeah and um, so yeah it's a sure sign of a concussion I had that pretty much every game I ever played is that right yeah because I my my favorite thing was the hit guys yeah you had the puck I was so I saw red I was a bull <laughs> so yeah and. and was it because of head to head, or was it just a a hit, and you yeah. didn't really have to hit your head? No, and it's just. I think it's just the impact and the force and the, you know, how we can dig into the ice and have so much leverage. Yeah. Um, you know, you think about a big hit, and you think about the brain and the skull. It's going to hit the front of the skull, the back of the skull, and the front again. So you got three bruises on your brain. Whether it's a huge impact or a little impact, it's still moving. I mean, your brain's not stuck in a. Mm -hmm. So. It's a yeah. It's a really uh, it's not fun to think about. So that you said the first one was probably your worst one. Yeah, just because. Or is I, that the one that just got the ball? Because once you yeah, get it, I don't know a ton about this stuff. I mean, yeah. I know it from hearing it, and that's why I call you today important. And we're gonna do you know Brad Lukowicz again and his wife actually tomorrow. All the things that as a pair, as a husband and wife had to go through. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is why I think this is important, and I think it's it's important because guys. Frankly, guys have balls now to talk about it, yeah. where I said we didn't. So does each concussion get worse or not necessarily? Yeah, it's, each one's different. Um, I remember the, my, the first one, I remember it felt like a tra uh, truck was running over my head. And just like for five minutes, and then it kind of kind of released. And did you leave the game, or did you? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. I was, yeah, I was pretty much knocked out. Okay, uh, that was like that was the closest I ever was to being knocked out. And uh, I remember just being so woozy and sick, and I was that was the only time I was nauseous from one. But um, took a while to recover from that, and then my second game back, I tore my MCL, and then when I came back from my MCL, I broke my arm. So it was like that was that concussion was kind of the. Got, Snowball, yeah, for injuries, and then I actually had a after I got traded to Austin, had a had a healthy year there, and then the year twenty eighteen, I had three in about a three or four month span, and I remember the second one was just like, like no no disrespect to him, but like Matt Duchesne like just pinched my shoulder up against the glass, like it was just trying to rub me out. He didn't try to light me up or anything, right. but I just remember like that one really screwed me up. And it wasn't even like a big impact. It was kind of just like the angle I, my head hit the glass. and So there is, is there nothing that once you have one, they come? it's easier to get one? Yeah. It's, well, you have to be like fully recovered. And what is fully recovered? No one knows. Does anybody know what that is? No, because like no one really knows anything about concussions. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've learned a lot about that. I was going to say, yeah. you're, you're close to an expert now, it seems like. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, there's not really an answer to that. I know that there was... One time, and I don't know which game it was, and maybe it was that in 2018, I'd read something that you said that you were in the second period and you had no idea what happened in the first period. Yeah, well, that was in the bubble. That was uh, that was when I knew I was. So I take the, I, I my last concussion was uh, the concussion that ended me was in Minnesota in 2018, and it took those 22 months off. Was that a hit with Felino? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I remember going in the summer, I went to a neurologist, and he told me my headaches were coming from anxiety and depression. And I was like, well, one, I'm not depressed. Did he I say, mean, it's kind of, go home and have a beer? Yeah, yeah. This, that was really the words that came out? Yeah, so I was shit you not. And the best part about it is this neurologist is the, the neurologist who creates our concussion test that we have to pass to play. So cool. it's like uh, that. Th so then that right there was just the beginning of it, of rock bottom. Because there... I'm listening to the guy who creates our tests, the guy who, we're, you know, 
luckily I had him in Pittsburgh, you know, like how, how lucky am I to have this guy here? I can work with him all summer. I went there, I wanted to do like a six hour workup and he didn't, didn't really want to hear anything of it. They gave me What's like, involved in a six hour workup? Kind of just, uh, I would do like two, two hours of like neurological tests with pencil and paper, and like memory tests. And then they put me through a workout and then I'd do all that all again. Okay. And then pretty much by the end of it, he said that my anxiety, my headaches were coming from anxiety and depression. Um, and it had nothing to do with the concussion. Yeah, that's what he said. And he said he said like everything looks good for you. Uh, go back and have buddies with your beers. The headaches will go away. And uh, I remember I went right from there to the casino. Yeah. Just to get a beer. Yeah. And I remember drinking that beer and then and then leaving and and like on my way home and was like okay. It was April, but it was April then. I went like two weeks after we didn't make playoffs that year. I went like the week after we got home, and I remember like, okay, I got three months to to get right. And the days went by, and I got worse. And then it came to a point where I had to start working out again, right? And skating. And I remember I I I I, I skipped. I mean, I, I would work out Monday through Saturday. I mean, I was very strict with my regimen in the mm-hmm. summer, and I remember. Making up an excuse on Monday, making up an excuse on Tuesday. To yourself? No, to my trainer. Okay. Just texting him like 10 minutes before, hey, I can't make it, blah, blah, blah. Right. But he knew the reason why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and so I show up to camp, and I'm a mess. Uh, I, I slept through my alarm the first day of practice. I remember showing up late, and um, I was messed up. And I was, I, was, uh, I, was, I was supposed to have a big role that year with Miro. Sure. I was... I was uh, that was Miro's rookie year, and I was supposed to be, you know. And uh, I remember talking to Jim after the first practice, and Jim Nell, yeah, yeah. And I told him, I said straight up, like I'm not okay. There's this place in Florida. Um, that was the place that Daniel Carcillo went to, where he did a documentary on it. I spent ten days down there in the first week of training camp, and like just pretty much dying, and. Uh, it was brutal. I came back and just felt worse. And then I remember listening to a pod, I listened to a football podcast, and every Monday they do like a recap of all the games. I, and I just remember being okay. It's week three, and then all of a sudden it was like week seventeen. Just like time just evaporated and nothing changed. And um, I was going. I think in one month I was in fifteen different states or ten different states, seeing different doctors, mm-hmm. flying everywhere. I remember. Landing from Boston, hopping on a plane to Scottsdale, then got then to a plane to Park City, all with different neurologists and different stops. Was this on your own, or were they sending you to all these different places? Were you trying to find the right guy, or? <laughs> well, I didn't have much help. Um, I don't really want to get into that story because that's 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 for a different time. Um, but yeah, my my girlfriend at the time pretty much became my doctor, and. Uh, so that was that was probably the most frustrating part, and I tell this in my documentary, but um, I remember I had my first mental breakdown when I found out I didn't have a blood patch or a, a cerebral spinal fluid leak. And, oh, right. and you have to go in and lay there for a couple hours. Or yeah. So what they would do on in that. is they would take a shit ton of blood out of your arm, they poke a hole in your spinal canal. Um, I've had four epidurals. So I know what it's like to feel to be paralyzed. For, for a woman, it's kind of yeah. epidurals like a woman has yeah, when they're having yeah. a C-section, I believe. So I was paralyzed from waist down for a couple hours. Yeah. Um, and then they would shoot the blood into your into your spinal canal, and you'd have to sit there and wait for two days, three days. You couldn't you couldn't stand up. The only time you could stand up was to go to the bathroom. And what is this going to tell you? So they they thought that I would have a, they had a leak in my spinal canal that caused these headaches, and. Uh, you know, after my fourth one, I'm in the I'm in the MRI room because they put dye in it this time to see if there was one. Right. And the the radiologist radiologist was like, I was sitting in a wheelchair, <laughs> and he was like, I don't really know where your headache's coming from, but this is not it. He's like, we can't. He's like, I would recommend to never to not do this procedure again because it was my fourth one in about four, yeah. two months because uh, my neurologist I was working at the time recommended it. And I tried to get in, in touch with my neurologist after that fourth blood patch, and he was no longer working <laughs> as a neurologist. He was in pharmaceutical sales now. And and it was the same guy that was recommending all four different ones? Yeah. And then he was also the same guy that recommended me to other people. But then I found out he was just kind of sending me to his buddies. 
Did you at one point, it was this prior or after all this, that you got in touch with Sidney Crosby? Uh, or somebody there, was that prior to all that? Or? My, my agent reached out to his and kind of, this was probably eight months into my process okay. of not playing. And this is probably eight months past training camp date. And my agent talked to his agent and kind of gave him the list of doctors that he saw. And I'd seen them all. <laughs> you had seen all of yeah, them already? Yeah. And there were, nobody really had any answers nah, for not even like a, Not even like a... No, not literally nothing. Like my, when I say like truly nothing, there was nothing that even touched my headache. Um, nothing that even almost made it made it go away. Yeah, I had one time one of the one of the to- crazy amount of neurologists I worked with shot this like numbing serum up my nose, and I remember feeling it go down my throat, and I didn't, and like my whole kind of neck and head went numb, and that was the only time I haven't had a headache since the hit. And, Four and a half years. I mean, so do you have to get those kind of shots regularly? No, I, no, I won't do that. It's oh, yeah, it was so brutal. So how how are they now? I, I uh, mean, are you getting? Is there progress or? Uh, no, they're pretty they're pretty stagnant. Um, like right now, I'm rolling at probably like a six out of ten, but it's just kind of there, and I've learned how to deal with it. And yeah, I was gonna say, it's just something you find a way to live with. Yeah, and uh, you know, obviously, my journey did a lot for me, and. I've, I've realized and, and heard a lot of people's stories after telling mine. Let's and, talk about that. Yeah. How did it come about? Because I saw something, you saw a video. And, yeah. And I didn't know what that meant. I saw a video and that kind of helped you. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> not to get like too dark and eerie, but I was about 10 minutes away from uh, hopping in my car and driving off my, my bridge. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was a mess. I probably bought a tequila down that day and... You know, smoking a ton of weed and just an, an absolute, just to get get just get to, away from the yeah, pain. Yeah, just to get anything, just to yeah. get any uh, happiness. And uh, I remember looking at my dog and and kind of saying, "All right, like this is it." And I was, I yeah, I had the note and everything, and uh, came across this video. And this dude kind of, I kind of went on this YouTube dark hole, black hole, and listened to this guy's story and how uh, you know he just. Lot, his, his career was taking off and then it kind of plummeted. He had just lost his dad. His relationship uh, of, of many years had just dissolved because of everything that he was going through. And I uh, just really resonated with everything he was saying. And then I came across this video of him walking across America. And it was like a five minute music video and kind of, well, then I did even more of a deeper dive on that. And then I was like, kind of had this, okay, I'm gonna roll right across the country. And I think that if if Totes doesn't respond to me, I, I'm not here anymore. So we'll go to that. But the the guy that did the video, did you ever get a chance to meet him? Or re, I mean, do you know the video that you're watching? Do you, I mean, did you know? No, was yeah. It, was that a singer? Yeah, he's or? a singer. Yeah, um, and he had, like he has a song that everyone probably knows uh, just from being in bars and stuff. But um, it kind of it, I don't want to say it saved your life, but at that oh, day it saved your life. One hundred percent. I. Uh, yeah, I uh, I still no, I've never met him. Um, he probably doesn't even know who I am. But I, I remember I just messaged him on Instagram about halfway through my trip and okay. just said thank you. And you did. That, that was did it. you did he respond at all? No, but I just <laughs> did, obviously didn't give him any context or anything. But um, just felt like I needed to say that because yeah, he's that absolutely. Yeah, it saved my life. So you mentioned Totes, yeah. Jeff Totes. <laughs> yeah. He's working with Dallas at the time. Stars. Yeah. He's a videographer, I believe, is what he was doing. I remember seeing his shit. Like he's good. Oh yeah. He, he was he was a rock star, and you all the guys in the truck would talk about him. You know, from Vito to Razor. Yeah, yeah. Talk about how good of work Totes did. So, wh- how did your relationship with you two first start? Become- I mean, yeah, we were always friendly around the rink and stuff. But he was he was younger, and we were talk. You know, through our trip, we obviously talked a lot. Yeah. And one thing that came up by over and over again was, man, I wish. I wish we were better friends whenever we worked together. Yeah. But he would always say how he was a younger guy and felt like there was a there was a a gap in a, yeah. a gap and and he needed to be on the professional side and you know. So, I mean, he's one of my best friends now. I mean, we're we have matching tattoos, so Oh, do you really? <laughs> yeah. What are the, are they, are they the, significant? That's, that's that, oh, is that yeah. the oh, that's the rollerblade. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, we got cool. the, we got the Portland and uh I was getting it and he was like, "I'm going to get it too." Is this when you guys were already in, in part of the trip? Yeah, this when we were done. So where, so where did the trip begin? My my driveway. It did. Mm-hmm. Was Totes there when it started? Yeah. So he flew to you. Yep. 
your hometown. Yeah. And did you have this thing mapped out, or did, did, was this just one eight hundred wing it? Yeah, it was. A, it was. Yeah, it was one eight hundred wing it. But it's crazy too, is because we started and we just started going west. Well, my buddy who lives in Cleveland was like, "I want to join you tomorrow. Come stay at my house tonight. I'll join you tomorrow. We'll go." So he did that, and then I ended up actually going through Notre Dame and then through Chicago and then through Rockford, and then up to through Minnesota, where mm-hmm. the hit ended. So I literally fall, or I st- went from Cleveland to Ann Arbor, to Notre Dame, to Chicago, to Minnesota, through Minnesota. So I kind of literally followed What time my, of the year? Was this all in summertime? Yeah. Okay. We left July, or we left June, I want to say we left like June 10th or something like that. Okay. June, or, um, so I literally followed my hockey career, and then I had my... And so that was by design. No, it, oh, was it wasn't by, by design. Yeah, it was kind of like, okay, where are we going now? I was like, oh shit, we're gonna go through Notre Dame. We gotta stop there. Oh, okay. Oh shit, we're gonna go right yep. to Chicago. We gotta stop there. And then we were in Minnesota, and I remember Minnesota being unreal. But then we got to South Dakota, and something was different. And I had my like my mental breakthrough in South Dakota. So it was kind of like, if I, what do you mean by mental breakthrough? I was, uh, I, I just had this. I mean, the first it took me like. Two, probably two, three weeks to get through all those states. And then once I got to South Dakota, it was kind of like, okay, this is the real grind now. We're about halfway. And um, I just remember rolling, like rollerblading through the Badlands Yeah. in South Dakota. And have you, ever been, have you ever been there? I was on my way to Sturgis one time with a bunch of us. And I was up front and I took a wrong turn. <laughs> so we ended up going through the Badlands. Sick. And it's funny, there were all these little kids with little bows and arrows, right? And they're climbing behind the rocks and things like that. And they were kind of following our path. And now all of a sudden we got down a couple gravel roads and we're like, and you know, you have your phones that kind of tell you yeah, where yeah. you're at, but nothing's working there. We have no clue. And they were actually trying to shoot at us. But they, well, I mean, they were, they're a little tough. They'd go and they'd go about four feet and they'd hit the ground. <laughs> and then next thing you know, they'd be running to the next place we were going and we'd be stopping on these little dirt roads. So to answer your question, yeah, yeah, I have been there. And we, that, you know, I was on the way to Sturgis and things like that. Totally my fault for going there. But I'm actually glad we went through there, you know, to be able to see yeah. that whole thing. So you kind of took that same path then. Yeah. So we, I mean, so from Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, it's all cornfields. So every, well, wait, every, now, let, don't. Let's not put down Wisconsin, okay? It's South Wisconsin is pretty cornfieldy. It's very cornfield. Yeah, I'm from yeah. northern Wisconsin, so yeah, yeah. yeah. And I did see that you stayed at Joe's house, Pavelski's yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. So did you get, reach out to Joe ahead of time? Is just hey, or he was he following the the whole path of what you were he, doing? He was following, and then uh, he kind of said, "If you come my way, let me know." Okay. And then, so we kind of we drove straight north from. So Chicago you stayed in Clover. Yeah. Oh yeah. We oh, stayed. Yeah. 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 This is a pretty sick spot. Yeah, I'm about two hours north of that. Nice. So yeah. Okay. So you stay at Pavelski's house, which got to be kind of cool. Yeah, hey, not bad. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so then, uh, so it's just cornfields, 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 and then we get to South Dakota and go through the Badlands, and it's obviously you've been there, you you know what it's about. And I just remember I rollerbladed through you know eighty ninety percent of it, and I remember doing like the last turn to get to take the straightaway out of the park. To civilization. And I just remember kind of like. Yeah, we were driving at the time, and I just remember I was driving, and I kind of pulled over, and I just started crying, and he's and Totes filmed it all, and I kind of have... Well, what hit you? I just like this overwhelming feeling of like, holy shit. Like, that you've done, that you did that much? No, or? no, that like, I get to like, I'm, I can't believe I'm doing something like this. Okay. Like, you felt proud of yourself? Oh, not... No, because it wasn't, it wasn't, the job wasn't like, the journey wasn't over yet. Okay. There's still a lot of ways to go. Yeah. But it was almost like a, a feeling that like clicked in my brain. Like I'm almost like I feel like I'm almost back now. OK. Like to who I know I am. I'm doing the right I, thing. Yeah. I, I know that I'm doing something right and important. And I know that that this is going to be like a life changing thing for me. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like uh, an extra boost to just keep going. And um, I didn't have one day where I thought about quitting. Yeah. And it was. And I had so many days like that. And so it's a struggle to get to that point for the most part. You're battling through just like you do games and everything yeah, else. Yeah. Did it make the rest of the trip any easier for you? Oh, yeah. Just clarity-wise? Yeah, clarity-wise. Um, and you can even hear it in the, in the documentary in my voice through interviews and stuff. And just how, how much happier my voice sounds after South Dakota. And just like Really? Yeah, it's... Uh, 
it's a wild. I, I really hope that people can see it, but we're still I was working say, on that. This is something that needs to be out there. We'll get into that yeah. in a little bit. <clears throat> So the rest of your trip, how many, so how many states did you have left or how many stops did you have left so or however what, you look at it? We did, um, I'm going to get it messed up too. We did from South Dakota, we went through Montana, then Idaho, then Oregon, I think. Now did you, so did you have a, an ending point or were you no, just No, we going? were just going to the coast. We were, so we got through the Badlands. We went down to go through, I rolled through Yellowstone, almost gotten some shit in Yellowstone. Yeah. And, uh. Then Bobby Ryan. Wait a reached, second, what shit? Oh, uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> you can't just say that. Yeah, so if, over if, if you've ever been to Yellowstone, it's pretty much one yeah. road that's just a big circle. Yeah. So I was just rollerblading at different times at cool spots where there wasn't traffic. And I come flying around the one corner one time, there was a huge bison just sitting in the middle of the road. <laughs> well, there's about 30 cars packed up behind it waiting. Waiting it for it to move yeah. off the road or something? And we were the first ones coming around the bend to it. Yeah. So then I hop in my truck real quick, and as soon as we get past it, I got out and I just started buzzing. Yeah. Just because I was probably like 10 feet from it. And then the next day we were kind of shooting the shit. Does Toast with, have that on film? Is he uh, filming? Uh, no, he was driving. So he oh, was, okay. uh, um, it was kind of one of those moments that. Uh, so was he not filming as he was driving? He, he would, uh, he would sometimes, but a lot of times if it was like a sweet spot, um, he would be like, all right, I'm going to go up. And he'd go up a couple miles and throw the drone. Why the hell up. wouldn't Totes have like a GoPro or something hooked well, up to the Like I said, 1-800 winging it. You were? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so he would either go up, throw the drone up, or go up and set up and wait oh, for Oh, he'd it. get ahead of you yeah, so he could yeah. get a shot at you coming up. and stuff. Did he not have any drones or anything? Because I know that he's used drones, I think, no, in, the, in the locker room and things yeah, like that flying through. Yeah, he had, he had one the whole time. He there's did? Some, there's some crazy shots, yeah. Okay. Like, uh, the crazy, my, besides the Badlands, I remember being about 50 miles, we were about 50 miles east of the Badlands, we were on 90. We, were, we did a lot of driving in South Dakota because there wasn't roads to the blade. Yeah. And I remember we got, I got out on Route 90 and there was a big, it was like a five mile straightaway and there was no cars, you could see the whole way. And he was like, I, I told him pull over, I wanted to rip it. And I remember he went up and I watched him go for about 15, 20 minutes. And I was like, oh, shit. Just out of sight. You can't see his yeah. taillights anymore? So I'm sitting there. I'm waiting for him to like, kind of give me the call to go. Yeah. And these four bikers come flying around the corner. And they of course. they stop and look at me. And Did they pull over? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just and see if you're okay. Yeah, or... I was sitting there on rollerblades in the middle of South Dakota. <laughs> and they're, uh, they're like, you all right, man? Yeah. What are you doing out here? It's like, oh, my buddy's up there. We're uh, blading across America, all yeah. this. And the one guy looked at me. He goes, you know, you're probably the only person... In the history of humanity to be standing right here with rollerblades on. Do you have that? That's not on film. No. Did you not have your phone with you? No, I, I just didn't like think of it. It was just like one of those <laughs> shooting the shit conversations. Yeah. And that was a, like a kind of moment to me where I was like, okay, that got me even more juiced up to go to the Badlands because we're obviously Googling stuff, seeing where we're going to, sure. seeing what it looked like. And we'd never heard of it. And then that just got me, going through the Badlands truly got me addicted to national parks. It seems like... When you say that was the moment, you mentioned the Badlands a lot. Yeah. Like, I can tell that that was your spot. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, that's number one. It seems like you should have a tattoo of the Badlands. Well, my, Sedona's my spot. Sedona, Arizona's my spot. Okay. But uh, the Badlands is definitely number two. It, it seems like that was an opportunity missed on Totes' part. That, that, <laughs> that shot, I mean, with the bikers coming around the oh, corner. Oh, yeah, but it was, he was already long gone. And it was even, almost you want to reenact that. Moment. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> I wanna, I, I, yeah, I will go. And what's cool, too, is I do want to, one, one of these summers, try to find the route that we took. Sure, and yeah. just, like... But you, did you keep track of every road, everywhere? Like, did, no, I wish no. we would have. But yeah. he, where he would throw the drone up, there's a GPS tracker. Okay, yeah. So we kind of have, like, a... We could kind of make our way through it, but so I'm assuming at least the way that you guys are doing this, you didn't have to worry about any traffic, you didn't have to worry about any bad weather, no, yeah. that kind of stuff. We actually got really lucky with weather. Uh, the one day it rained, um, we were driving straight north, so it was we weren't we weren't losing any. Yeah, uh, that we just drove the whole day straight north. The one day to uh, get to Coeur d'Alene to meet up with Bobby Ryan. Uh, I was going to ask you about that. Did you know Bobby before prior to this? I'm assuming. I mean, I obviously knew who he was, but no, nah, I never met him. How did, how did that connection happen then? We were up for the Masterton together that same year. Okay. Um, and he actually he ended up winning it, and he reached out to me about a week. He was obviously following your journey somehow, social yeah, media wise. Yeah, because okay. that first post blew up pretty big, um, and then so he reached out to me right away and was like, "Hey, if you're coming through Coeur Lane, let me know. Would love yeah. to get together and." And talk or skate with you and 
So we kind of made it an effort to get to get up there and see him, and it was awesome. Did you guys just spend a couple hours together? Did you hang out overnight or anything? Uh, we went to dinner the night before, and then uh, in the morning he kind of showed us around and then bladed out of town with me. Yeah. So it was pretty sweet. So are there, are there any other um, – so your journey's not quite over yet, right? So you've got how many days, miles left from there? Uh how many states? Three, four so, left. Well, yeah, we had a we had a certain point where it was totes needed to get to the. He had a job. He, he had to get back to work. He had work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he had a job. So we kind of we had to do a little bit of driving the last couple of days, but um, we went through uh, Oregon for the last last three days. It took us to get through Oregon, and it was unreal. So you, you talk about Bobby Ryan. Were there any other? I mean, I heard, I saw something you mentioned, some guy by the name of Jack of Trades. Oh, yeah. That, uh, besides this guy, explain what he does. But are there any other guys, Bobby Ryan athletes, or any other people that you met along the way that uh, stood out to you? I'm sure you met a lot of people. We were we were in such the middle, we were in such areas where we were in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Um, I remember we were in South Dakota, and we were, we, we just bullshit with everybody we ran into. Right. And that's one thing I learned going with totes is, Talk to people. Yeah. Just, yeah. And uh, we had some amazing conversations with people. And I remember a lady, she was going to get her something done with a recall in her truck. So you have to drive 120 miles to the to the, lo- to the closest Chevy dealership. Yeah. Like, Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> did any of these people resonate with your story? And, and did you, you know, like, they were so happy that you were doing it because you were kind of rollerblading. You were blading for them too because they had things. Did you meet anybody like that along the way? Yeah, we met this. We went. To, we actually we went to uh, Bozeman, Montana. We were sitting down at the bar and started talking to this older guy, and he ended up being the owner of the bar. Uh-huh. And his wife came, and we ended up talking to him for about four hours. And by the end of it, all four of us were crying. And it was just kind of one of those. Was he going through? Some yeah, of they, stuff? like I told my story. Like Jeff told story, his story, and then. The owner of the bar told his story, and then his wife told her story, and it was kind of like, it was one of those moments that, I mean, I, I still talk to him on Instagram. I was going to ask you, do yeah. you guys keep in touch? Oh, yeah. I st- I, there's still a lot of people I talk to. I met a Marine out in Oregon. Um, I felt like the big, <laughs> I'd stop, because I, I have a terrible fear of heights. Okay. So when I met him, I was telling the story about how I couldn't even look over the dam at Yellowstone. Yeah. And I follow him on Instagram, and he's a squirrel suit guy. <laughs> so he was probably thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So who's who's the jack of trades guy? I think uh, that's what it was. Jack yeah, of trades yeah. or something. It's just these these two dudes who were rolling around the country, uh, trying to just like shooting content, and they were in D.C. and they messaged me and they were like, "Hey, if we drive to Chicago, what, could you like rollerblade with us?" So they drove through the night, rollerbladed with us through Chicago, and then I've probably hung out with him four or five times mm-hmm. since. Oh, uh, yeah. He, he came. I ran a place out in L.A. this summer for three months, and he came out and stayed with me for a week and. Yeah, I made some really cool friends and really yeah. cool connections throughout the trip. And um, I want to yeah. say I, I, I heard of there was a, a younger boy that you met that you mentioned in some article that I read. Yeah, so it was the second day. I actually, I was crazy on my on my drive here today or on my drive here this past weekend. I took all back roads from Pittsburgh. Okay. And uh, actually, Why? just I, highways give me anxiety now. Oh, okay. I just don't like I don't know, and I I like rolling the windows down and going forty five. Yeah. Have no rush to go anywhere. Yeah. So I um, actually filled up at the gas station, and it was our second day of the trip. This kid kind of, we we're, we're, we filled up, and I'm rollerblading out of the gas station, and this kid goes, Steven? I kind of turn around, and we were probably three, four hours west. This is west. early in your trip. Yeah, this is west of, and this is in the middle of Ohio, and this kid was like, hey, man, like, I can't believe I'm, this is you. I, I don't, like, I never, I don't follow hockey or anything, but I saw your post this morning. And I kind of like read into a little bit and then I looked up and I saw you. I just want to let you know I was having a really rough morning. And then like when I like after I read yours, it felt better. And I looked up and saw you. He's like, I can't wait. It was like a 16 year old kid going to high school and um, dealing with typical. High yeah. School shit. Yeah. And, and and that was kind of the first thing was like, holy shit, this is a lot bigger. It, it, it than, means a lot, something. This is right? a lot bigger than just me doing something for myself. It's going to. Yeah. I yeah, I really hope that um, people can take in the documentary when it eventually comes out and uh I think it's really going to help a lot of people. So it seems like a lot of people along the way or certain people, it was even more motivation for you to make sure that you finish something you started. And yeah. Yeah. And then well, I, it was just so cool to hear people, what they got out from what I've done. Like I've heard stories of people, there's like a huge walking group now that 
you know, 30 people get together in their community once a week and walk and kind of have like a therapy session with their friends. They just talk about what they went through last week and kind of lean on each other. And uh, I had a kid last weekend said, or during the charity event, he said, told me, he said he never watched a game I played and told me I'm his favorite NHL player. And that's just kind of really, yeah, it's just, it's, that's powerful. Yeah, it's very powerful. And, um, you know, I'm more famous for rollerblading than ever playing in the NHL, which I'm completely fine with. I was going to say, it seems like that's probably a shit way to put it, but it almost happened for a reason. Yeah. I mean, look at the, the amount of people that you're helping and you didn't even know that you helped them. Yeah. You know, and that's why I, I said that this, this conversation is important. Um, and I, I, I thank you for being like this because again, I, Talk to other people, and they they don't have the same balls, and I, and that's nothing on them. They yeah. don't feel comfortable enough to tell the story. Um, so now you guys are at the point. When did you when did you know we got something? Uh, like was it early on, or did it take some time was, throughout the trip, was or was a, it after you looked at everything? It was as soon as we posted. Um, you know, I posted that I was because I kind of in my post announced my retirement too, and then. Did you do that on purpose? Um, no, just, just, uh, it's just the, just way, the, way, the way I worded it, yeah. Okay. And um, I remember waking up, what kind of post that night, and I remember waking up in the morning with 500 <laughs> like, like messages to me. Messages? Yeah, Not yeah. just yeah, likes yeah, or anything. It was, I mean, I, and that was, for the first week, I tried to respond to everybody. I mean, it was, it was crazy. See, and you tried to get back to everyone. Yeah, and then it got to a point where I was like, okay, I need to. <laughs> yeah. My downtime, my, wheels on the road. Yeah, my yeah. downtime, my eyes are closed. Um, yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, the, the, the stories I've read, the stories I've listened to from people. Um, you know, my, I, I've, I had a big come to life moment where I realized that my situation could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Like I still have my thoughts, I still have my memory. I just deal with a headache, yeah. and um, I don't know what. I'm going to be looking like in 20 to 30 years, but right now I know I'm really happy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I I don't know where I'd be if I was still playing. I don't I don't miss hockey. I miss the boys. I miss the locker room. Sure. That's what we always yeah. miss, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, people keep asking me, you know, are you going to get back into hockey? And it's like. Would you like to get, would you like to, even, even if it's not in a coaching, in a role that you yeah. know really well right now? Or what about with the league or something like that to where you wish there were more voices that could help more people through. Yeah, I think I think eventually, but uh, I mean, right now I'm still still going through it a bit, just yeah. especially this time of year. I mean, you probably experience because, it too. because of hockey season. Yeah, you probably still experience it. it's like August rolls around. You yeah. wake up with a little extra jam. It's a, it's a body clock. It's yeah. it's in us that that time of the season comes along and we're looking now. We're, you know, your preseason games just don't mean shit for yeah. the most part, and but you're paying attention to all that kind of stuff. Same for you then. Yeah, it's. It's and I'm in my prime right now. I just turned yeah. thirty, so yeah. I should still be playing. That's when I should be signing my my ticket to retire. Yeah, and, um, you know I'm not. And uh, but you're not ready yet. Maybe that time yeah. will come. Yeah, yeah. Like I even driving like today's the first time I've driven the tollway since I retired. <laughs> yeah, you and, don't miss that all bet. Well, I yeah, not at all. You missed the drive into the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, I lived in Uptown, so it was perfect. Okay. So, but I, I, uh, I it, it kind of brought back really bad memories driving this tollway because my for my two years that I was out, I remember driving the tollway to Frisco and driving back, and I would cry the whole way there and I'd cry the whole way back because was it pain? Or pain. I couldn't explain to anybody. My mom would call me and just ask me how I was doing, and I didn't lie. I was like, I'm horrible. Yeah. Like I, I'm. I was. Uh, what, when you say you couldn't explain to it, is it because they didn't understand or they didn't? They weren't they did, feeling it. Yeah, I thought they didn't understand, and then I also didn't want people to like know that side of me because I was a miserable prick. I mean, yeah. I, I, I was miserable, and uh, I mean, give anybody. You think that's a, why you don't miss it? Because fuck it, it's over with. Yeah, done. Yeah, I mean, of course I miss it, but not not like you'd think I would. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think there's a bigger, there's something bigger out there for you with your experience that you've gone through, and when it comes along, it'll hit you in the, hit you between the eyes, yeah. so to speak. You know yeah. what I mean? So, okay, where are we at with the documentary? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm actually, I'm actually going over to Totes' house today to, to kind of figure that out a little bit more. But um, fortunately, we weren't able to release the, 
the version that we had just because of what uh, are what are the roadblocks you get what are the hurdles that you have to go through uh just that kind of they didn't want fights hits all that stuff um so i got we got to kind of figure out a way to maneuver around that which is a little frustrating but um i'm not really paying the league in a bad light but um maybe they you'd like to but you're not going yeah, to. yeah. <laughs> no you're taking the high road yeah yeah but it's frustrating i mean i guess that's the word to, to sum it all up yeah let's go back to a little while ago, you mentioned Jim, Jim Neal. Um, Jim Neal and Rick Bonus. The best. And and, it, and why? Well, uh, Jim Neal, first off the bat, regardless, take out what anybody ever says, thinks, whatever, as far as a general manager. Yeah. He is a superhuman being. Superhuman being. So um, can you talk about those two guys? Yeah, Jim, anytime that uh, I wanted to, to go see a new doctor, to take some time off to, to get right, um, he was in my corner 100% the whole way. Um, and I don't want to speak to any other organizations, but I honestly don't know where I would have been if I was um, in a different organization, especially a big market where there was a lot of pressure on. Yeah. You know, I, I signed a three year contract and I didn't play the first two years of it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and that, and that, I, I, lay, I laid with a lot of guilt for that. I mean, yeah. I wasn't just, like, a lot of people just thought I was sitting at home collecting paychecks and having a great time. It yeah. was, it was almost I would I would get my paychecks and like almost I would get like nauseous about it because I grew up because in a, you felt guilty. Yeah, I, I grew up in an area and my dad works in a steel mill still Blue to this day. So it's like you you earn what you work for. Yeah, and I wasn't working and I was making all this money. So that was like a that even snowballed me even further into a depression and um, yeah, just a just a really really nasty time that uh, unfortunately I didn't didn't really get much help. Yeah. yeah. What about Rick Bonus? Uh, the bonds is the. I was telling someone the other day. I think like as much as it hurts me, I think I might be a Jets fan this year. Like that's <laughs> sure. how much that guy that's means. That's how much respect. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, my when I came back after my 22 months and the whole time I was out. Um, obviously there was a lot of things going on in the organization at the time and uh, every practice that I was around or even if you saw me around the rink, he'd ask me how I was doing. He he call me, text me, just just the best and. Uh, the moment that will always, I, don't know, I, I think that, you know, if my memory ever, ever goes, I don't think I'll ever forget this one. It's, it was a game I scored in uh, Madison Square Garden. I was really emotional. My parents were there. First game I was there. The first game they'd seen me play in two years, and I scored, and we won. And very emotional night for me, but I had the worst headache that I'd ever had. And I was, wasn't supposed to play the next game, but Bones asked me if I wanted to play. We were supposed to back, a back to back, and... We did the video in the morning, and then I, I remember like, coming out, and I mean, he, he's like, you, "Do you want to go? Like, you go. We want you in the lineup." And I just remember like just full on breaking down, and he didn't even ask me; he just gave me a hug and let me cry on his shoulder for a solid five minutes. And what 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 was the breakdown about? Did I just you, couldn't physically play. I just there was oh, no okay. chance I could get on. You were the ice. disappointed that you couldn't yeah, get out there again. You know, I fought so hard to come back, and then you know had such a great night, but then. That night I scored, I thought my I thought my career was over, mm -hmm. and then I grinded, you know, f until the shutdown, and just prayed to God I didn't get hit. And I mean, I was I was I was in a really bad spot, headache wise, and just kind of emotional. And uh, I remember going to the bubble and, and knowing that this is this is going to be it. Right. Yeah. Right. If I take one hit here, I'm done. Like, yeah. Yeah. And you you made that decision for yourself. Uh, yes and no. I think my body made it for me. I, <laughs> I was walking to pregame meal and I remember bumping into the wall and just bumping into the wall gave me like the most excruciating headache and I was like oh yeah I'm, I'm, I'm fucked yeah yeah okay so yeah. explain how you came up with mental miles it just seems so fucking appropriate Sean Shapiro that right? Yeah. So we were. You give that to Sean. I, giving the credit to I Sean. I give a hundred percent of it. To I Sean. just talked to him last week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he he joined us in Ohio, or maybe it was Ohio or Michigan, either, either one, and we were kind of coming trying to figure out what we were going to name it because we had nothing. We mm -hmm. were two days, three days into the trip, and we were like, okay, we got to make T-shirts or do something to raise more money. And uh, yeah, he's just like, what about Mental Miles? I mean, totes kind of so was Sean other. calling you on a daily basis or weekly or just uh, at one time or he called he joined <laughs> so he, he joined us he and he joined he drove my truck for a bit while totes oh was he filming. did oh yeah okay and then uh, he wrote the story wrote another story on me and then 
uh, would call me and text me throughout. We still we still keep in touch. I actually have to call him back, but um, yeah. yeah, awesome, awesome guy. What's next now? You're, you're heading back to Pittsburgh, or yeah, heading back tomorrow. Okay. Uh, start the drive back. Do you tomorrow. keep your? Do you have? A, you said your place here. Do you still have? No, your place I don't. Here? No, okay. no. I still still keep my membership in my golf club down here, though. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. So it makes me come back <laughs> okay. a couple times a year. How's your golf game? That's all right. Yeah, I got a lot of time to work on it now. Yeah, so. that's all right. Got to do something. So, is there any more? Uh, will you guys add to this documentary? Is the documentary done? It's ready to go. We just need to somebody say, let's let us do this. Yeah, pretty much. And so you've got some hurdles, obviously, there that you're talking about that you're going to have to try to get through. Yeah, and then um, I want to do another one. Uh, I want to go Maine to Florida or Florida to Maine. Um, I I'll wanna... do it with you. Yeah. Are, you roller, are you rollerblading? I'll be on the two wheels. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do want to bike. I'll, I'll have a motor I'd, between my I'd, legs, but... I, w- I would probably bike the night the second time, yeah. Um, just to make it less strenuous on uh, on the driver behind, because sure. Totes was. I mean, he was. The thing is, people don't realize is like, oh my, how hard was it? And like, I couldn't imagine driving across the country going twenty miles per hour. Oh, I, I yeah. agree. Yeah, so I he, can't fucking sit in traffic. Yeah, so he was grind. He grinded the whole time as much as I did, and uh, yeah, I think I think a bike would be the the better option for yeah. for round two. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes weather comes into play too, and there's no yeah. place to hide. Trust yeah. me, you need some cover. Yeah. So, is okay as we wrap this up. Is there anything, any message that you'd want to get out as far as you know, summing this whole thing up to anybody that may be going through the same kind of shit that you've had to deal with? Yeah, I think that I don't know if someone's listening to this or watching this. I think that if you're if you're struggling or at a point where you're like, oh, I can never, I'll never be back to where I was. It's okay, maybe not, but you can do things or you can like you can change your life like that you just kind of have to take it in your own hands at some point um it took me a long time to do it but i kind of had something to trigger me and i hope that this project or what i've done and what i talk about is a trigger for other people yeah and like i've said throughout my whole trip was if i save a million people could make fun of me a million people could laugh at me but if i'm able to save one life so that's all it that's all I care about. That's all you need to say. Yeah. So I I respect to know tone limits what what you're doing, how you're going about it, and you're going to show other people, you know, that it's that's okay, and you need to talk about it. You yeah. need to get it out there, and I we got to find a way to get this this documentary of yours out there because people need to see it. Um, I thank you for coming in to do this. I know these aren't easy, and you've probably done many of them. Yeah. Um, but like I said before, it's important, Stephen. I yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, brother. I, yeah, Thank th- you. Thanks for giving me a platform. I, yeah, I have, a, have a good trip back to Pittsburgh. And are you going to take the highways? You're going to go through the cornfields, through the cornfields. I'm, I'm right. actually going to I'm actually going to go through the Blue Ridge. It's perfect time right now. See, and that's the best time to be riding Harley's is through the cornfields, oh, yeah. and you can zigzag your way. All you need to do is look up at the sun and know that you're going <laughs> the right direction. I, I have a little Vespa. I want to take that across the country. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I, I think I think I break down too many times. All right, man. Stephen Johns, um, let's hope this documentary gets out there ASAP. Thanks again for being here. And that is it for our episode of Suds with Luds for today. Thanks for joining.